Pre-Election Survey. What is this election about? In this timely series, several Mises Institute scholars and writers come together to discuss the themes running through the 2020 election race and the most important policy issues for the American presidency. In terms of policy, what is the most important reform the next president and Congress should make and why? Which candidate do you think is most likely to support these reforms, if any? Joseph Becker. The 2020 U.S. presidential election is the second referendum on the political elite's welfare warfare agenda. The political elite are nothing if not arrogant, and as such greatly underestimated in 2016, the Trumpian appeal combined with the masses' disdain for most things Washington. Unfortunately for those who despise statism, corporatism, and its resultant destitution for the non-ruling class, these political insiders are taking fewer chances this election. A hatred-energized coalition of media interests, corporatists, government beneficiaries, including the education cartel, and perhaps most dangerously, government intelligence agencies themselves, are now working feverishly to both muzzle anti-establishment populist views and disseminate their own self-serving representations, all to further insert themselves into the personal and economic lives of the citizenry at large. Given the complete lack of any other justification to cast a vote for the morally and philosophically, yet somehow not financially, bankrupt Biden, his candidacy serves as a near-perfect proxy vote for establishment elitism. Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory could hardly have created a better control group candidate, one who, other than being the feeble, empty vessel chosen to carry the establishment's water, embodies little more than all things government for the benefit of those connected closely to D.C., I continue to believe voters distrustful of long-persisting, power-hungry professional politicians outnumber those voters favorable to such politicians, that is, the real deplorables. If true, the defeat of Biden should depend only on the voters' ability to see beyond the coalition's attempts to portray this election as something other than a second referendum. Zachary Yost the next administration and Congress should urgently work to rein in the military-industrial-scientific complex. War is the health of the state, and few things have contributed more to all other domestic troubles than this ever-expanding blob. As blob, bureaucrats like Alexander Vindman, Anonymous Miles Taylor, and the parade of other intelligence officials involved in the Trump-Russia collusion impeachment fiasco make clear these people will not limit their meddling to the affairs of other countries on the other side of the globe. Inevitably, the war comes home. Only Trump has any chance of making headway on this issue. Unlike Biden, who is in the thrall of the neocons and liberal interventionists, Trump talks the talk, though he has difficulty getting the bureaucracy to walk the walk, partly because of his own foolish personnel decisions. There are signs of hope that a second Trump administration may make wiser staffing decisions, most notably the recent nomination of my former boss William Ruger to be ambassador to Afghanistan. Additionally, Trump and the Republicans will likely have their sights set on knocking the intelligence community down a few notches as payback for the impeachment circus. Finally, bringing the troops home from Afghanistan and chastening the intelligence establishment would be urgently needed blows for American liberty. Peter Klein Concerns about big tech, real and imagined, have flourished in the past few years, and both major parties have taken a tough stand against Google, Amazon, Apple, and the social media giants. On the antitrust and regulatory side, policymakers seem poised to return to the 1950s era paradigm in which large market share rather than narrowly defined illegal conduct 
is cause for government action against private firms. Breaking up the big tech companies, forcing social media platforms to be content neutral, adding requirements for data privacy and portability, and similar moves will stifle innovation in one of the key sectors driving economic growth and improvements in the quality of life. The Internet has flourished largely because it has been one of the least regulated sectors of the economy. Reversing that policy will be a disaster. While the Republican Senate and Trump's administrative agencies have been harshly critical of Google, Facebook, and Twitter, threatening to break them, regulate them, or replace Section 230 with something worse, a Biden administration and Democratic Congress would be no better and would likely pursue a more aggressive antitrust and regulatory policy throughout the economy. Freeing up entrepreneurs to innovate should be a top priority for the next administration, but I'm not optimistic no matter what the outcome of the election. Peter St. Ange With so much to choose from, it's hard to pick just one top issue for the next president. Lockdowns is really the most topical in the near term. America needs a president who understands that voluntary responses rather than obligatory lockdowns means that you can protect the vulnerable and the elderly without invoking depression levels of unemployment, bankruptcy, and collateral damage ranging from suicide to substance abuse to delayed medical care that could outweigh many times the direct death toll from COVID-19. Philip Bagus. The most important reform is to introduce sound money. The next president should introduce a pure gold standard and open up for monetary competition. This is the most important reform because it cuts off the government from the financing through inflation and artificially low interest rates. The size of the government would have to shrink considerably. Moreover, it eliminates the distortions, bubbles, and crisis caused by our current monetary system. None will support such a reform. Mark Thornton I'm going for some low-hanging fruit and say they should reclassify cannabis, that is marijuana, from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 5 drug or declassify it altogether. Schedule 1 drugs are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse, like heroin or LSD. It is now the case that cannabis is recognized by doctors as having multiple medical uses and a low potential for abuse. This rescheduling can be done by the President, the Attorney General, the Congress, and potentially the courts. Cannabis has been legalized by multiple states without calamity of any kind, and enforcing the law is expensive and harmful to individuals, families, and communities. Biden claims he wants to decriminalize cannabis, but I believe a lame duck Trump administration would fully legalize it. Cannabis prohibition has been a travesty of justice and something that future historians will be puzzled with bewilderment. Jonathan Newman Policy-wise, the most important reform the next president and Congress should make is to expand school choice and relinquish as much control over the education system as possible. The reason this is so important is because many of the other problems in the U.S. stem from the fact that a large enough proportion of the voting public has been taught that government is the solution and not the cause or aggravator of these problems. If, for example, we learn as kids that FDR and his New Deal got the U.S. out of the Great Depression, then we will likely not question the government when it responds to crises, real, exaggerated, or imagined, with new spending and regulation. School choice and privatization of schooling would certainly give way to more ideologically diverse curricula, such that more students will learn the historical perspective economic principles, and critical thinking required to question the government and establishment media. Donald Trump has made expanding school choice a significant part of his 2020 campaign, and his Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, has also made initial strides in reducing the federal government's involvement in education. 
Robert Murphy. In my judgment, ending the lockdowns related to COVID-19 is the single most important thing to do. However, those coercive policies are not being applied at the federal level. Since the question pertains to the President and Congress, I think the single most important item would be to abolish the Federal Reserve. All of the U.S. federal government's horrible invasions of liberty, both domestic and abroad, would be sharply curtailed if the Congress had to directly tax or borrow the money honestly without the Fed waiting in the wings to electronically create new money with which to monetize Uncle Sam's debt. Though Bishop, I think one of the most important policy battles we're going to see is maintaining what degree of federalism still exists in D.C. COVID has exacerbated revenue shortfalls for the most profligate and poorly run states, and the Democratic Party has continually sought to make blue state bailouts a part of COVID recovery packages. This simply is making well-run red states pay for really bad state policy. Similarly, a politically viable and significant reform for a variety of government programs can exist by decentralizing much of the social safety programs. For example, breaking up the numerous healthcare-related policies and allowing states to develop their own programs with block grants would place the management of these programs on states rather than centralized power. Similarly, Donald Trump has spent significant time discussing transforming education spending to be child rather than school focused, highlighting the work of Dr. Corey DeAngelis. These would be significant steps forward. If I were made king for a day, I would prefer to burn the welfare warfare state entirely and the Fed down with it. Unfortunately, I don't see any political party seriously engaging in something as basic as Ron Paul's competing currency bill. I do think we could see a major attempt to nationalize the major mistakes of our worst states, and that is something that I think can be stopped with a Donald Trump presidency. David Gordon According to Zeke Emanuel, an advisor to Joe Biden on COVID-19, Quote, we cannot return to normal until there's a vaccine. Conferences, concerts, sporting events, religious services, dinner in a restaurant, none of that will resume until we find a vaccine, a treatment, or a cure. We need to prepare ourselves for this to last 18 months or so and for the toll that it will take. We need to develop a long-term solution based on those facts. It has to account for what we are losing while this fight goes on. Things like schooling and income and contact with our friends and extended family. End quote. Is this what the American people want? Or do we need instead to end restrictions now and get back to our normal lives? I think this is the single most important issue in the election. Walter Block. If my hero Ron Paul were president, I think the first thing he'd do is bring all the troops home. I think the second thing he'd do is issue a full pardon to all nonviolent, victimless criminals, sex, drugs, gambling between consenting adults, plus whistleblowing, etc. I think the third thing he'd do, assuming in all these cases he had the power to do so, is eliminate the Fed. Why these reforms? in order to promote liberty. Which 2020 presidential candidate is most likely to institute these reforms? I'd put them in this order. 1. Joe Jorgensen 2. Donald Trump 3. Joe Biden None of these people are Ron Paul or even Rand Paul. None will do all three, but I would rank the likelihood in that order. Here are some more reforms I have no doubt Ron Paul, my litmus test for excellence in a politician, would undertake. Fourth, a unilateral declaration of free trade with all nations. Fifth, radically reduce taxes and subsidies. Sixth, radically reduce government regulations. Donald Trump has some good instincts. He has promoted peace in the Middle East. He's tried to bring at least some troops home 
and then got stomped on for doing so by the swamp creatures. He has moderately reduced taxes and regulations. Vis-a-vis -vis Joe Biden, I enthusiastically support the Donald. Alice Sales A Joe Biden victory would show that legacy and social media companies wield a stronger influence on politics than ever before. A Donald Trump win would mean that the left's narrative doesn't stick, despite the lengths it goes to, to make it the nation's dogma. Whatever happens, support for Trump will continue, and he will retain influence if he consistently opposes the lockdowners and supports those opening the country. Alan Mendenhall If you watch too much television, you probably think the 2020 presidential election is as much about personality as it is about felt policy. Don't forget that presidential elections have decades-old implications, in particular for the federal courts. The U.S. Senate has confirmed well over 200 of President Trump's nominees to the federal bench. The nominations of Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett are only a small piece of a much bigger picture. President Trump's judicial selections now sit not only as Article I judges on the U.S. Court of Federal Claims and the U.S. Tax Court, among others, but also as Article III judges on district and circuit courts across the country. Make no mistake, few of these judges are philosophically libertarian, and I doubt more than three, I'm being generous, could explain the core teachings of the Austrian School of Economics. Their commitment to originalism, however, and their mode of judging and guiding beliefs restrain them from growing government in important areas. Don't get me wrong, there is much more at stake in this election than just the federal judiciary. Imagine if Jane Sanders or Janet Napolitano were to replace Betsy DeVos as the head of the Department of Education. But because federal judges serve life tenure, the future of the federal courts should suffice to convince those who are, so to speak, on the fence in swing states to climb down and vote, however grudgingly. Patrick Newman can any libertarian with a modicum of principle or intelligence say that a Biden-Harris White House will lead to a smaller increase in the size, scope, and power of government than Trump-Pence? Truly, it is a case of choosing between the lesser of two evils, but the choice is very clear. The future is by no means guaranteed under Trump, but we all know what is coming with Joe Biden, another progressive era. Jeff Deist. This vote is not about policy or ideology. It is about a nasty cultural war engendered by the relentless politicization of everything. COVID lockdowns in an election year only intensified the animosity as the relatively non-political or apolitical spheres of life, family, church, sports, travel, movies, bars, restaurants, receded in importance. Millions of Americans became stuck at home, living, mostly online, and seething at their political opponents. This is clearly an unhealthy political climate and an embarrassing one. Can electing or re-electing a president help? Doubtful. The imperial presidency of the 20th century effectively bypassed Congress, creating a managerial federal superstate. Now that superstate has a life of its own, independent of or even actively undermining its own putative boss. Agencies like the CDC, FBI, CIA, and NSA have become wholly unaccountable and frighteningly powerful mini-governments unto themselves, while lawmakers flail impotently. So each political side lives in fear of the whole apparatus and with good reason. Wars, entitlements, deficits, debt, and an expansionary Fed all add up to one conclusion. It's too late for public policy. So as difficult as it may be, the only meaningful reform a president could initiate would involve the serious devolution of federal power to states and cities. Subsidiarity, rather than ideology, 
appears the only way forward in a country with 330 million people of wildly divergent views and interests. Trump has some good decentralist instincts in his approach to COVID-19, allowing governors to lead with different approaches. He wanted to get out, at least partially, of our intractable Middle East wars. He wanted to drain the swamp. He understands business to a degree, but he lacks focus and is susceptible to flattery, which is how DC barnacles like John Bolton ended up in his administration. Yet, unlike Biden, he has some sympathy for the ideal of an America not entirely run by DC. Should Trump win, we can only hope the deep blue states begin to agree. For more content like this, visit Mises.org.